the planning of Operation Overlord and its implementation on June 6, 1944, involved many different components. One of those vital parts was the presence of able leadership. Allied leadership had to devote considerable attention to many issues, such as supplies, to ensure a sufficient amount of food, medicine, and ammunition for the campaign that would follow the landings on D-Day. After the Allies decided on Normandy as the invasion site, they appointed Dwight Eisenhower as Supreme Allied Commander of the Allied Expeditionary Force for the invasion of Europe. The determined general faced an enormous task and only had a few months to plan the operation, on which many laid their hopes for decisively ending World War II. Working with the various personalities in the Allied leadership made his task more difficult. Eisenhower and President Roosevelt did not always agree, and Eisenhower even struggled at times in his relationship with Winston Churchill. Eisenhower dealt with other difficult personalities besides Roosevelt and Churchill. Because planning on such a huge operation could not be done by one person, other various military figures received appointments as naval, air, and ground commanders. Trafford Lee Mallory was appointed to command the air forces of the Allied Expeditionary Forces. While planning the invasion, he advocated the transportation plan. The Allied aircraft would focus on destroying the railway system throughout occupied France to ruin German supply and communication lines. Although Eisenhower approved this plan, Lee Mallory clashed with other Allied leaders about his strategy and tactics. Both Arthur William Tedder and Carl Spatz disagreed with Lee Mallory. Tedder had served as air commander in North Africa and was named Deputy Supreme Commander of the Normandy invasion in early 1944. Spatz commanded the U.S. Strategic Air Force in Europe and advocated a different strategy. Contrary to the transportation plan, Spatz wanted to target German oil production and industry to cripple them. Leaders were needed for the ground and naval forces as well. Bertram Ramsey was appointed naval commander-in-chief of the Allied Naval Expeditionary Force. He oversaw Operation Neptune, the amphibious landing of Operation Overlord. His position as Deputy Naval Commander in North Africa and Operation Husky in Sicily provided him with the experience to plan an amphibious assault on the Normandy beaches. Bernard Montgomery was placed in charge of the Allied ground forces for D-Day. Eisenhower's preference was General Harold Alexander for that position, but he diplomatically gave the appointment to Montgomery and even approved his plan for expanding the invasion force and landing area. Other prominent military leaders involved in the planning of Operation Overlord were Omar Bradley, Miles Dempsey, and even George Patton. Bradley was appointed to command the first U.S. Army in the invasion, and Montgomery selected Dempsey to command the mixed British and Canadian Second Army. Because the Germans considered Patton central to any plan to invade Europe, the Allies made him a prominent figure in the deceptive Operation Fortitude. Through fortitude, the Allies successfully convinced the German High Command that the Normandy landings were a purely diversionary attack and that the true invasion would take place in Pas de Calais. Even with exceptional leadership, planning and practice for such a large invasion does not always go smoothly. On April 28, 1944, Exercise Tiger took place off the British coast at Slapton Sands. German e-boats intercepted the large convoy and hit three ships with torpedoes. Nearly 1,000 men were killed in the sinking or damaging of three LSTs. Amidst the tragic loss of life in the rehearsal, Allied leadership worried that Allied soldiers might have fallen into German hands during the attack, and they nearly changed important operation details. Secrecy was so vital that families didn't even know how their loved ones had died. One British mother didn't learn how her son really died until 40 years later while watching a documentary about Exercise Tiger and making a connection between the dates. Operation Overlord remained a secret despite the disaster. The need for a cross-channel invasion to liberate France was recognized early during the war. Although this necessity was understood, actually finding a suitable invasion site took extensive research. 
When the Allies selected this site for the long-awaited invasion, they sought to balance a number of important considerations, such as the state of enemy defenses, the reach of Allied air cover, logistics build-up feasibility, and sustainability of the terrain for subsequent breakout. Four sites were considered for the landings, Brittany, the Cotentin Peninsula, Normandy, and the Pas de Calais. As Brittany and Cotentin are peninsulas, they were rejected because it would have been possible for the Germans to cut off the Allied advance at a relatively narrow isthmus. Brittany in particular was ruled out rather quickly, despite its extensive port infrastructure. It was the most distant location for the transports to reach and invasion there would have forced the Allied armies to attack without sufficient air cover and then fight their way across France. Pas de Calais offered advantages in distance from embarkation to debarkation and from the beaches to the heart of Germany. It was also the location of the sites for V-1 and V-2 rockets, then still under development. On the other hand, because it was such an obvious place to land, it was also the place the Allies expected the Germans to defend most heavily, and the Luftwaffe had numerous airfields close to that area. Moreover, it offered few opportunities for expansion, as the area is bounded by numerous rivers and canals. Normandy was hence chosen as the landing site, but many strategic and geographical considerations were evaluated. Among them were the nature of the beaches, moon phases and tidal range, sites of airfields and sailing distances from channel harbors. In more detail, the invasion plan envisioned dropping elements of three airborne divisions at night near Caen on the eastern flank and north of Carentan on the western flank. The airborne infantry mission was to seize important bridges and causeways that provided exits from the beaches and slow or eliminate the enemy's ability to organize and launch counterattacks. The American infantry divisions assigned to land at Utah and Omaha beaches would attempt to capture Carantan and San Lo the first day, then cut off the Cotentin Peninsula and eventually capture the port facilities at Cherbourg. The British at Sword and Gold Beaches and Canadians at Juneau Beach would protect the U.S. flank and attempt to establish airfields near Caen on the first day. Possession of Caen and its surroundings would give the Allied forces a suitable staging area for a push south to capture Falaise, then swing left to advance towards Paris. The invasion planners specified a set of conditions regarding the timing of the invasion, deeming only a few days in each month suitable. A full moon was desirable, as it would provide illumination for the airborne operation. The landings had to be scheduled for shortly before dawn, with the water level midway between low and high tide. This would improve the visibility of obstacles on the beaches, while minimizing the amount of time men had to spend exposed in the open. Specific criteria were also set for wind speed, visibility, and cloud cover. In his 1948 book Crusade in Europe, Eisenhower explains why moonlight and low tide were important. The next combination of moon, tide, and time of sunrise that we consider practicable for the attack occurred on June 5, 6, and 7. We wanted a moon for our airborne assaults. We had to attack on a relatively low tide because of beach obstacles, which had to be removed while uncovered. Eisenhower had tentatively selected June 5th as the date for the assault. However, on June 4, conditions were clearly unsuitable for a landing. High winds and heavy seas made it impossible to launch landing craft, and low clouds would prevent aircraft from finding their targets. By the evening of June 4, the Allied meteorological team headed by Group Captain James Stagg of the RAF predicted that the weather would improve sufficiently so the invasion could go ahead on June 6. Allied control of the Atlantic meant that German meteorologists didn't have access to as much information as the Allies on incoming weather patterns. As the Luftwaffe Meteorological Center in Paris predicted two weeks of stormy weather, many Wehrmacht commanders left their posts to attend war games in Rennes, and men in many units were given leave. Rommel himself returned to Germany for his wife's birthday. Had Eisenhower postponed the invasion, the next available period with the right combination of tides but without the desirable full moon was two weeks later, from the 18th to the 20th of June. As it happened, during this period the invaders would have encountered a major storm lasting four days, between June 19th and the 22nd. That would have made the initial landings impossible.
In the weeks leading up to the still undefined D-Day, commanders argued about every detail of Operation Overlord. Sometimes the arguments grew contentious. In one just a few weeks before the invasion was launched, British Air Chief Marshal Trafford Lee Mallory, under whose aegis the airborne forces would operate, got cold feet and told Lieutenant General Omar Bradley that he feared casualties among the U.S. 82nd and 101st Airborne Divisions would be catastrophic. He urged the commander of Overlord Ground Forces General Sir Bernard Montgomery to cancel the operation. Furious, Bradley replied that if the airborne and the glider landings were eliminated, then he would insist that the whole Utah beach plan be scrapped. Ultimately, Montgomery had to step in and settle the heated disagreement, ruling that the airborne and glider portion of the invasion would proceed as planned. Lee Mallory's pessimism and predictions of doom were one more burden for General Eisenhower to carry. In his book Crusade in Europe, Eisenhower notes, if Lee Mallory was right, it appeared that the attack on Utah Beach was probably hopeless, and this meant that the whole operation suddenly acquired a degree of risk, even foolhardiness, that presaged a gigantic failure, possibly Allied defeat in Europe. The airborne and seaborne landings at Utah Beach had been deemed vital, because in addition to being a blocking force that could prevent a counterattack against the western end of the invasion area, the troops that landed at Utah would be in good position to head north and capture the deepwater port at Cherbourg. Nobody liked the look of Utah Beach. Eisenhower himself described it as miserable, even though he didn't want to cancel the assault. On the landward side was a shallow, wide lagoon, crossed by narrow causeways, on which the Germans would certainly direct their artillery. If the Germans could hold on to the exits from these causeways, the troops would be trapped on the beach. The planners of Operation Overlord were worried that two of the three American infantry divisions selected to land on D-Day had not seen combat before, but it could not be helped. The only other experienced combat divisions on that side of the world were tied down in Italy. Selected to lead the charge at Utah Beach, therefore, was the 4th Infantry Division. It had been decided that the units going into Normandy on D-Day needed to rehearse their actions in places in Britain that most resembled the actual landing places in France. For that reason, the beach at Slapton Sands and Lime Bay on the Devon coast was found to be an almost identical twin to the place where the troops destined for Utah Beach were scheduled to land. On April 27, 1944, it was decided to use live ammunition during a rehearsal known as Exercise Tiger. That morning, the landing ships were delayed, and the officer in charge, Admiral Don Moon, decided to delay the landing for 60 minutes. Some of the landing craft didn't receive word of the change and disembarked their men according to the original timetable, just as the now rescheduled naval bombardment began raining shells down on the beach. The men of the 4th Division had never really expected to be placed in harm's way in what was supposed to be a simulation, but suddenly found themselves in danger of being blasted into pieces. In the ensuing chaos, scores of soldiers crossed the white demarcation line as they were attacking their imaginary enemy that ended up directly in the kill zone. Rumors circulated along the fleet that as many as 450 men were killed. As if that weren't bad enough, soldiers participating in an exercise after midnight encountered an even greater tragedy. A squadron of German torpedo boats appeared out of nowhere and began attacking the unsuspecting flotilla. In that one terrible night, more than 800 U.S. servicemen died. It would be a toll far greater than what the division would suffer on D-Day. The casualty lists were kept top secret. Families were only notified that their loved ones had died due to a training accident. Despite the tragedy, Operation Overlord would go on as scheduled. After being delayed for 24 hours because of a strong storm sweeping through the English Channel, the Great Day arrived, and with it, a great armada that had been assembled for Operation Neptune, the assault phase of Overlord. The 4th Infantry Division had been designated Force U. Troops destined for Omaha Beach were Force O. Once the beachhead had been secured, follow-on forces would arrive on Utah later in the day. These included the 90th Infantry Division and the 4th Cavalry Regiment. To soften up German defensive positions, 18 ships from the U.S. Navy and Royal Navy pummeled miles of shoreline with thousands of high-caliber shells. 
20 minutes before the scheduled seaborne landings, 300 B-26 came in low over the beachhead and bombed the German positions. This was in stark contrast to what happened at Omaha Beach, where the Navy overshot its targets and the Air Force bombed too far inland. At 0630 hours, 300 men of the 2nd Battalion, 8th Infantry Regiment, became the first seaborne unit to hit the beaches of Normandy on D-Day. The men threw themselves on the golden sand, waiting for enemy machine guns to open up on them. Surprisingly, the only battle sound to greet them was the crump of random artillery shells and the ripping sound of shells still flying overhead from Allied ships offshore. Utah Beach was divided into three sectors, Tear Green, Uncle Red, and Victor. The men of the first wave quickly realized that they had landed on the wrong sector. The strong current had pulled them too far to the southeast, and three of the four designated control craft that were supposed to have guided the Higgins boats in had been lost to mines. Five minutes after the first wave hit the sands, the second wave, Companies A and D of the 1st Battalion and Companies G and H of the 3rd Battalion, began arriving at Terre Green. Next came the amphibious tanks. A group of 32 duplex drive Sherman tanks was supposed to have arrived 10 minutes before the infantry, but rough sea conditions caused them to be 20 minutes late. Four of them never made it at all because their ship struck a mine and sank. The remaining 28 tanks made it safely to the beach. The 4th Division had planned to have artillery support on D-Day, but a large landing craft carrying 60 men of the 29th Field Artillery Battalion struck a mine and all 60 were killed. At about 10 a.m., elements of the 22nd Regiment arrived and began eliminating enemy strongpoints along the shoreline. In some cases, naval gunfire had to be called in to finish the job. Meanwhile, the 8th Regiment was pushing farther inland. Companies B and C advanced upon strongpoints WN7 and WN5. Companies E and F advanced to WN4, where they met little resistance. As this action was taking place, Companies G and H moved southward and came under machine gun fire from strongpoint WN3, but soon captured the position. For soldiers who had never before seen combat, the men of the 4th Infantry Division were doing a remarkable job. Soon, the 2nd Battalion began pushing along Causeway 1 to exit the beach. As more men and vehicles piled into the sand, Causeway 2 became the main exit off the beach. The casualties of the two American Airborne Divisions were heavy, as Lee Mallory had feared, but they managed to sow confusion among the enemy, stop reinforcements from reaching the beachhead, and captured important towns and road junctions. Thanks to the paratroopers of the 101st Airborne who knocked out the batteries at Braycourt Manor and Holdy and then captured St. Marie du Mont, the 3rd Battalion of the 8th Regiment advanced along Causeway 2 practically unopposed. By mid-afternoon, the 3rd Battalion linked up with elements of the 82nd Airborne south of St. Mary Glees and then encircled a group of Georgians belonging to an Ost Battalion. The Americans needed to neutralize this position that threatened the later arrival of glider reinforcements. The Georgians stubbornly held out until the next day, when a coordinated attack from the 4th Division and the 82nd Airborne forced them to abandon the area. As June 7 wore on, the skies were filled with combat gliders swooping in with additional troops, equipment, and supplies. Although many gliders crashed upon landing, those that made it were contributing to the overwhelming success of the landings on the Utah beachhead. The total casualties of the division on the first day were 197. Once Operation Overlord had succeeded, Eisenhower wrote, Our good luck was largely represented in the degree of surprise that was achieved by landing on Utah Beach, which the Germans considered unsuited to major amphibious operations. Eisenhower's words were a fitting tribute to the men of the 4th Infantry Division. Omaha Beach was a critical link between the Cotentin Peninsula and the flat plain in front of Caen. The terrain was difficult. It was unlike any of the other assault beaches in Normandy. Its crescent curve and unusual assortment of bluffs, cliffs, and draws were immediately recognizable from the sea. It was the most defensible beach chosen for D-Day. For that reason, the experienced 1st Infantry Division was tasked to land there, along with the 29th Infantry Division. The high ground commanded all approaches to the beach from the sea and tidal flats, 
Moreover, any advance made by the U.S. troops from the beach would be limited to narrow passages between the bluffs. The objective was for the beach defenses to be cleared in two hours, whereupon the assault sections were to reorganize, continuing the battle in battalion formations. By the end of the day, the forces at Omaha were to have established a bridgehead eight kilometers deep and link up with the British 50th Division at Gold Beach. The assault troops had been led to believe that they would face second-rate troops. The recently activated but formidable 352nd Infantry Division was relocated from saint Lô to Omaha as part of Rommel's strategy to concentrate defenses at the water's edge. As part of this reorganization, the 352nd also took under its command three battalions of the 716th Static Infantry Division. The failure to identify the reorganization of the defenses was a rare intelligence breakdown for the Allies. Post-action reports still documented the original estimate and assumed that the 352nd had been deployed to the coastal defenses by chance a few days previously as part of an anti-invasion exercise. The source of this inaccurate information came from German prisoners of war captured on D-Day. Allied intelligence had already become aware of the relocation of the 352nd Division on June 4th. This information was passed on to the 5th Corps and the 1st Infantry Division headquarters, but at that late stage in the operation, no plans were changed. The 352nd contained a corps of 6,800 veterans on the Eastern Front. After the formation of the division in November of 1943, the troops were sent to Normandy. They mistakenly believed it would be a relatively quiet assignment. At first light on June 6th, a massive air armada that included B-17 bombers roared over the Normandy coastline. The bombers pounded German positions on the bluffs overlooking landing sites for two hours. German soldiers huddled in bunkers or trenches as deafening explosions shook the ground. The surface ships also opened fire at dawn. Targeting defensive positions along the bluffs that commanded Omaha Beach, the battleships Texas and Arkansas, supported by an escort of cruisers and destroyers, unleashed a deafening barrage that thundered across the surface of the English Channel. As the landing craft approached the beach, the battleships ceased fire and dazed German troops emerged from their bunkers to man their fighting positions. When the smoke from the bombers and naval guns lifted, it revealed the complete failure of the Allies to soften up the enemy positions. The B-17s, which had been designed for high-level bombing of strategic targets, had largely missed the mark and dropped most of their ordnance too far inland. As for the naval artillery, it had failed to do serious damage to the well-engineered German fortifications. When the invasion fleet was within a dozen miles of the beach, the ships began sending landing craft to shore. Whipped up by a 10-knot northwesterly wind, the seas swamped at least 10 landing craft during the run-in, drowning many of their infantry. The attempt to land artillery failed disastrously, and in all, 26 guns from elements of five regiments were lost. A special kind of sacrificial heroism was demanded by the duplex drive crews when, by a serious error of judgment, 32 were launched 6,000 yards from the beach. Each one, as it dropped off the ramp of the landing craft, plunged like a stone to the bottom of the sea, leaving pitifully few survivors struggling in the swell. The infantry was thus called upon to storm the beach without the benefit of vital armor support, which was intended to shoot open the way ashore. The few tanks that reached Omaha did so behind rather than ahead of the leading wave of eight infantry companies and one company of the 2nd Ranger Battalion. Near the western end of the beach, Company A was right on target as it neared its assigned landing zone at Dog Green but adjacent companies whose landing craft were pushed off course by strong currents were badly out of position. As the men of Company A prepared to go ashore, they did so without adequate flank support. Germans in the heavily defended Virville draw concentrated their fire on the isolated company. The entire operation began to unravel. Before the craft had made landfall, they were taken under heavy fire. One unlucky landing craft inexplicably sank a thousand yards offshore, while the troops on board activated their life vests and tried to desperately stay afloat. Another ill-fated craft abruptly disappeared in a violent fireball, the apparent victim of an enemy shell. 
When the Higgins boats made landfall and dropped their ramps, the horrific realities of combat manifested in seconds. Scores of men were killed and wounded in a matter of minutes. Those still on their feet struggled forward through the water. As they did so, they endured a steady hail of machine gun fire. Those who survived the enemy fire crouched behind anti-tank obstacles. Pinned down in a deadly interlaced field of enemy machine gun fire, Company A was out of action. To its left, Companies G and F, which had been forced off target by the waves, came into the beach together, an inviting mass of targets for the defenders. The remnants of the two companies inched their way forwards across the beach to the seawall, which offered a measure of cover but little protection from mortar and artillery fire. Because getting off the beach quickly was a paramount tactical objective, the men had been instructed to simply keep moving and leave the wounded to the medics. Obeying those orders would leave deep scars for survivors. As subsequent waves approached the beach, it was obvious that the entire assault on Omaha had turned into a nightmare, and nearly no one arrived at their assigned sectors. On the eastern half of Omaha Beach, which was assigned to the 16th Infantry Regiment, the landings had gone no better. Heavy currents nudged Company E off course, and it came in with elements of the 1st Division's 16th Infantry Regiment. Crouching behind the seawall, the survivors of Company F had lost most of their weapons in their effort to get out of the water. Company I drifted so far east it did not land for another hour and a half. The assault troops also experienced a traffic jam with their vehicles. Demolition teams had only been able to blow a half a dozen paths through the beach obstacles. The tanks, trucks, and bulldozers that had come ashore were trapped on the beach. The beachmasters halted further vehicle landings at 0830 until more paths could be opened. For the Germans situated on the heights, the beach below presented a target-rich mass of men. It seemed that the attack on Omaha was being handily repulsed. On the deck of the cruiser Augusta, General Bradley, shocked by initial reports, was of much the same opinion. Although the American landings on Utah had gone miraculously well, and the British and Canadian troops were making good headway in their sectors, the assault on Omaha Beach seemed to have degenerated into a disastrous and bloody nightmare. What's more, the initial casualty estimates were appalling, and it appeared doubtful if the disorganized survivors would be able to push inland. Bradley was giving serious consideration at mid-morning to pulling the plug on the entire operation at Omaha Beach and transferring subsequent waves to Utah Beach. The principal problem in almost every attack on every battlefield is to maintain momentum. Every instinct, especially among inexperienced soldiers, is to take cover under fire. Instinct is reinforced when bodies of others who failed to do so lie all around. It requires a considerable act of will to persuade limbs to act, which have suddenly acquired an immobility of their own. On Omaha Beach, the 29th Division became dangerously paralyzed. The veteran 1st Division on its left performed significantly better. Indeed, most Americans later agreed that without the Big Red One, the battle would have been lost. It was individuals, not divisions, who determined the outcome of the day. Although the Germans possessed the capability to maul and disorganize the American landings on Omaha seriously, they lacked the power to halt it absolutely. Despite the near total destruction of the first wave below Virville, a great many men survived to reach the seawall alive. Wherever the Americans managed to gain ground, they were able to keep it. Two hours after the landings had started, General Bradley was still receiving deeply gloomy reports, but the real situation was much more encouraging than the view of the beach from the ships. Small groups of Americans had already reached the high ground and began threatening the enemy strongpoints from the flanks. Companies A and B of the 2nd Ranger Battalion landed with the second wave and reached the seawall at the cost of half their strength and immediately pressed on to climb the cliffs. Staff Sergeant William Courtney and Private First Class William Braher of Company A were probably the first Americans to reach the top of the cliff at 8.30 a.m. 
When the Rangers gained the summit, they were too few in number to achieve a decisive success, although they sent word to a company of the 116th Regiment below to follow them up. In the next two hours, a succession of similar small-scale actions took place all along the Omaha front, driving vital wedges into the German defenses. 23 men of Company E, 16th Regiment, gained the hill and began to attack the strong point, which covered the east side of the St. Laurent exit from the rear. Brigadier General Norman Cota and his 29th Division Command Group reached the beach at 7.30 a.m. with the 116th Regiment headquarters. Cota began to move among the bewildered tangle of infantrymen. He saw two men of his headquarters group getting shot within three feet of him while his signaler was hurled 20 feet up the bluff by an artillery hit. A group of rangers had been huddled beneath the shingle bank for two hours when Coda appeared. In one of his legendary encounters of the day, the general demanded to know who they were. Rangers, he was told. Coda exploded. Then goddammit, if you're rangers, get up and lead the way. Coda personally directed the placement of Bangalore torpedoes that blew a hole in the barbed wire above the seawall. He was one of the first men who charged through the gap. Some 35 men reached the road to the top of the hill northeast of Verville. There they attacked mortar teams firing at such close range that the tubes were almost vertical. There were now Americans behind some of the most dangerous enemy positions covering the beach. By 11 a.m., Verville was in American hands. One by one, the German strongpoints were being knocked out by determined action from rangers and infantrymen. Some German defenders surrendered after they ran out of ammunition. The few German trucks that attempted to bring more ammunition to the front were blown up by Allied aircraft attacks. The gunners of Strong Point WN-62 had to destroy their pieces when the battery fired all its ammunition and then retreated southward on their horse-drawn limbers. WN-69, defending Saint Laurent, was abandoned early on June 7. The defenses further inland were significantly weaker and based on resistance pockets smaller than company size and strength. This tactic was enough to disrupt American advances inland, making it difficult to reach their assembly areas, let alone achieve their D-Day objectives. As an example of the effectiveness of the German defenses despite weakness in numbers, the 5th Ranger Battalion was halted in its advance inland by a single machine gun position hidden in a hedgerow. One platoon attempted to outflank the position only to run into another machine gun position to the left of the first. Further flanking maneuvers were met with fire from two more machine gun positions. By nightfall, the Americans controlled a perimeter up to a mile deep beyond Omaha. All plans for a rapid supply buildup were to be sacrificed to the need to get more men onto the ground. That night, Montgomery and Dempsey discussed the possibility of landing all further troops planned for Omaha on the British beaches. The suggestion was never pursued, but the fact that it was ever discussed is indicative of the alarm surrounding the situation at Omaha. An accurate figure for the casualties incurred by the 5th Corps at Omaha is not known. Sources vary between 2,000 and over 4,000 killed, wounded, and missing. The German 352nd Division suffered 1,200 casualties, about 20% of its strength. While the Utah landings had gone as nearly in accordance with planning as any commander could have expected, on Omaha, the failures and errors of judgment by the staff had only been redeemed by the men landing on the beach. The events of D-Day also emphasized the limited ability of high explosives to destroy strong defensive positions. Rommel had been correct when he said that the war would be won or lost on the beaches. If the American line at midnight on the 6th of June was still tenuous, the 5th and 7th Corps had achieved their vital strategic purposes merely by establishing themselves ashore. It was on the British front where so much rested upon fast and ruthless progress inland from the beaches that far more dramatic strategic hopes were at stake. Gold Beach was on the right flank of the 2nd British Army and in the center of the five Normandy invasion beaches. The beach itself lies between the coastal villages of La Riviere in the east and Le Hamel in the west. 
because it was quite rocky and surrounded by steep cliffs, the German high command deemed it highly unlikely that the Allies would attempt a landing there, but the coast was still well defended. In 1943, a powerful coastal battery was constructed between Gold and Omaha. The battery was located at Longus-sur-Mer and had a garrison of 184 soldiers, initially under the command of the German Navy. It included four naval guns with a range of 12 miles, as well as three 20mm anti-aircraft guns. The Germans also converted vacation homes on the beach into defensive positions, and La Riviere was transformed into a fortress. More than 2,500 obstacles, including wooden stakes, metal tripods, mines, and large anti-tank obstacles were placed on the beach. Many of these obstacles were placed on the high tide marker, as Rommel was expecting the Allies to land at high tide so the infantry would spend less time exposed on the beach. The British 50th Northumbrian Infantry Division, under the command of Major General Douglas Graham, was assigned to storm the beach. The division was mobilized in 1939 and served with distinction in France in 1940, North Africa, and Sicily. The beach was divided into sectors, Howe, Item, Jig, and King, which were subsequently divided into sectors Red and Green. Armored vehicles from the Westminster Dragoons and the 6th Assault Regiment Royal Engineers were meant to reach the shore before the first wave of infantry in order to clear up obstacles on the beach. The main objective of the 50th Infantry Division on D-Day were to link up with the Allied divisions landing at Juneau and Omaha, and to capture Bayou and cut off the road to Caen to make it difficult for the Germans to move reinforcements between the beaches. In the early hours of June 6, the Allied Air Forces bombed the coastal defenses and artillery batteries. An hour before the first landings were scheduled to begin, the coast was bombed once more by Force K, which consisted of 13 destroyers, four cruisers, and one gunboat. The battery in Longus-sur-Mer sprang into action and began shooting at the headquarters ship for Gold Beach, the HMS Bulolo. Two of the guns narrowly missed it, which forced the ship to retreat out of range. HMS Ajax returned fire and successfully destroyed three guns. The fourth gun was damaged temporarily. The crews were able to repair it and resume fire in the afternoon. In the meantime, the Royal Engineers were en route to the coast. They were only able to clear away a few obstacles as the first wave of infantry approached the shore due to German snipers firing on them. Twenty landing craft were damaged during the first wave, but the navigators followed their orders and stayed the course. As the landing craft were disembarking their troops, there was only a limited response from the Germans on shore. Virtually all of their strong points were damaged during the Air Force and Navy bombings. Two fortified gun emplacements at La Hamel and La Riviere were only lightly damaged, as they were heavily reinforced with concrete. These positions had embrasures that permitted a wide range of enfilade fire on the beach. Other strong points in the immediate area were also lightly damaged and had to be individually assaulted as the day progressed. At Jig, the first wave of infantry arrived at 725 and immediately came under fire from the fortified 75mm gun at Le Hamel that survived the bombing. The tanks that were supposed to arrive in advance of the infantry were delayed by rough seas and didn't arrive until 8. Many of the tanks got bogged down on the beach or were taken out by enemy fire. Two companies of the 1st Battalion Hampshire Regiment landed very close to the strong point at La Hamel and had to fight their way through enemy garrisons to get off the beach. Attempts to flank La Hamel were made difficult by the surrounding machine gun placements, mines, and barbed wire. They soon captured strong point WN-36 but had to break off the attack when they turned west and came under heavy fire from strong point WN-37. The only other way to capture that strong point was to circle around and attack the emplacement from the rear, a process that took several hours. The troops began to have some success with the arrival of the 82nd Assault Squadron, but the fortified houses had to be taken one by one in house-to-house -house combat. The gun at the WN-37 was finally silenced at 4 p.m. when one of the tanks fired into the rear entrance of the casemate. 
Although La Hamel wasn't fully secured yet, Companies A and C proceeded west and took out Strongpoint WN-38, where they captured 20 prisoners. D Company attacked WN-39 and the nearby radar station, capturing 30 more prisoners. The British were also halted at La Riviere, where infantry, tanks, and engineers arrived almost simultaneously. Units disembarking onto the beach immediately came under fire from the other fortified gun located there. The gun took out several tanks until it was hit by a tank of the Westminster Dragoons. Once the gun was destroyed, the 5th Battalion East Yorkshire Regiment pressed the attack and spent the rest of the morning clearing out the fortified houses in the village, at the loss of 90 men, including 6 officers. Meanwhile, a lone mine flail tank managed to clear a path from the beach upward toward Versamer. This route was used by the Green Howards, who cleared the remaining resistance in Versamer, and then advanced with the 5th Battalion southwest to Crepon, where roads led to the important targets of Bayeux and Cannes. Now the only way to hold back the British at Gold Beach was with a counterattack. Combat Group Meyer, which was part of the 352nd Infantry Division, was stationed near Bayeux. The unit was trained to reach the beach quickly from Brazenville, but in the early hours of June 6, the 2,700 men of the group were sent to investigate the parachute drops behind Utah. They were recalled when dawn broke and the scope of the invasion became apparent. One battalion was ordered to reinforce Omaha, and the other two arrived east of Bayou in the late afternoon, at which time they were met by elements of the 69th Brigade. The combat group was almost completely wiped out in the ensuing engagement. Meyer himself was also killed, and his detailed maps of German coastal emplacements fell into British hands. By the evening of June 6, the bridgehead at Gold was the strongest of the five, despite the remaining German resistance pockets throughout the beachhead area. 24,970 troops had landed, along with 2,100 vehicles. The 50th Division had lost around 700 men. Total casualties from all units involved in operations at Gold were around 1,000 men, of which 350 were killed. German losses are unknown. At least a thousand were taken prisoner. The British linked up with the Canadians at Juneau Beach on D-Day, but were unable to link up with the American troops on the western flank. The 50th Division also reached the Bayou Khan Road on the same day, and captured Bayou itself on D-Day plus one. Most students of World War II know that there were five invasion beaches included in Operation Overlord. There are numerous writings concerning Omaha Beach, where the 1st and 29th U.S. Infantry Division suffered heavily at the hands of the defenders. The successful landings by the 4th U.S. Infantry Division at Utah Beach are also well covered. But far less has been written about the other North American beachhead that day, Juneau Beach which was assigned to the 3rd Canadian Infantry Division and the 2nd Canadian Armored Brigade. In January 1944, the senior officers who would command the cross-channel attack arrived in England and reviewed the tentative plans for the invasion. Eisenhower and Montgomery agreed that the invasion forces needed to be strengthened to ensure the establishment of a beachhead, and so the 3rd Canadian Infantry Division was added to the invasion contingent. Tank support would be provided by the 2nd Canadian Armored Brigade. Juneau Beach was a five-mile strip of low, flat, sandy countryside. In some places, there were ten-foot-high dunes behind the beaches. The villages along the beach were all protected by concrete seawalls that would prove an obstacle to assault troops. So too would the underwater offshore reef that ran in front of the beach. Manning the Atlantic Wall along Juneau Beach was the 431st Ost Battalion and the German 716th Infantry Division. Formed from older personnel in April 1941, the division had been sent directly to Normandy and remained there until D-Day. All personnel had been trained in coast defense tactics, but the division was not highly raided by Allied intelligence. Nevertheless, the least motivated troops sheltered within concrete emplacements and armed with automatic weapons, mortars, and artillery had often given a good account of themselves against attacking troops with little or no protection. 
Allied intelligence also reported that the 12th SS Panzer Division was within a day's march of the beach, and even worse, the presence of the experienced and fully operational 21st Panzer Division was less than half a day's travel from Juneau Beach. On a cloudy morning with a wind from the west-northwest and moderate waves reaching nearly a foot high, the bombardment of Juneau Beach began. As would happen on other beaches, particularly Omaha Beach, the aerial bombardment largely missed Juneau Beach due to cloud cover and increasing dust from the bombing itself. The naval guns, on the other hand, didn't have the power to destroy the thick concrete defenses on the beach. Instead, it was hoped that the bombardment would stun the defenders long enough for the infantry to get close enough to eliminate them once the barrage lifted. Despite the impressive sound and fury of the bombardment, little was accomplished except in a few isolated cases where weapons had been put out of action by direct hits. The defenses generally were still in action when the fire plan had been completed and while troops were being landed. Because of tide and beach conditions, the landing times for each assault beach varied slightly. On Juno Beach, the conditions including the need for sufficient water over the offshore reef to allow the assault craft to sail over it made the Canadian landing the last scheduled. In the 7th Infantry Brigade sector, all the tanks were carried ashore by their landing craft. Most of the tanks stopped on the beach, deflated their waterproofing, and then opened fire in support of their infantry. Company C of the 1st Canadian Scottish Regiment had been attached to the Royal Winnipeg Rifles to extend their front. Landing on the extreme western end of Juneau Beach in Mike Sector, their immediate objective, a concrete casemate housing a 75mm gun, was found to have been knocked out by the bombardment. But the rest of the assault force had no such luck. Companies B and D soon realized that the bombardment had not touched this position, leaving them no option but to storm the position in a frontal attack. Faced with machine guns and mortars, which opened fire while the Canadians were still 700 yards from the beach, many fell as they struggled to exit the landing craft. Joined by tanks, the infantry soon captured the position for a high cost. At the end of this battle, D Company had only one officer and 26 men left standing. Landing with them in support, the 6th Company Royal Canadian Engineers lost 26 men during this assault. East of the River Seul, Strongpoint WN-29 was the responsibility of the Regina Rifles Regiment. Company A ran into fierce opposition when it disembarked in front of the Strongpoint. The company commander, Major Duncan Grosh, barely left his landing craft when he was shot in the knee. Men all around him were falling killed or wounded. His radio man was killed at his side. Unable to walk, Major Grosh saw the tide coming in and knew he would drown if he did not move. Struggling, he crawled towards the seawall, but the tide kept rising. Finally, two of his men grabbed him and pulled him into the dubious safety of the seawall. The company's second-in-command, Captain Ronald Shawcross, now took command. As he landed, the six men in front of him were cut down by enemy fire. He ran ashore and reached the seawall with only four other survivors of his platoon. As the company was pinned down on the beach, Lieutenant William Grayson, who was one of the platoon leaders, found a gap in the barbed wire in front of the enemy pillboxes and maneuvered to the rear of a house where he found himself behind the enemy. He raced forward, only to be caught by more barbed wire in front of a machine gun team. As he waited for the machine gun to finish him off, nothing happened. Realizing that the gun crew must be reloading the gun or changing the barrel, he tore himself free and raced to the concrete pillbox, where he tossed a grenade inside. The survivors fled, followed by Lieutenant Grayson. They led him to the next fortification, an 88mm gun that was also holding up to Canadians. He followed the fleeing Germans through the trench armed only with his pistol, and when he reached the position he was greeted by 35 enemy soldiers with their hands raised. With the machine gun and anti-tank gun out of operation, Captain Shawcross had his men jump the barbed wire and began a deadly race through the extensive German trench system. At the end of the day, Company A had only 28 men left of its original 120. With the initial assault companies ashore, the reserved companies began their deployment to push further inland. Companies A and C of the Winnipeg Rifles encountered stiffening resistance in St. Croix and Banville. The German defenders gave up ground only after the arrival of Bren gun platoons and tanks of the 6th Armored Regiment. Once these villages had been cleared, the Winnipeg Rifles advanced to Crilly, where they stopped to consolidate a defensive position for the night.
Company C of the Regina Rifles moved into Courcel, while Company D came under fire from German troops who infiltrated back into the trench that Lieutenant Grayson had cleared earlier in his bold dash. The regiment exited the town late in the afternoon and linked up with the Winnipeg Rifles by nightfall. On the beaches of the 8th Brigade, Company B of the Queen's Own Rifles Regiment landed directly in front of Strong Point WN-28 and lost 65 men in the first few minutes ashore. Because of the delay in getting the tanks ashore, no armor support was immediately available. Company A landed west of the Strong Point under mortar fire, but resistance was light and the troops moved inland. The reserve companies C and D suffered somewhat from mines attached to obstacles on their way to the beach, but this didn't impede their progress. Next in line along the beachfront, the North Shore Regiment landed in front of Strong Point WN-27, which appeared to not have been touched by the bombardment. Reducing that Strong Point fell to Company B, supported by Royal Engineers. They encountered a major concrete emplacement with a 50mm gun, machine guns, and 81mm mortars. Steel doors barred the entrance, and every conceivable approach was covered by fire. Using a series of tunnels, the Germans could easily move from position to position without exposing themselves to injury. With the reserve companies about to land, Company B was in need of tank support, but no tanks had yet landed in this area. C Squadron of the 10th Armored Regiment soon answered the call for help. The squadron had already lost four tanks, two drowned in the surf, another lost its crew to snipers, and the fourth was set afire by an anti-tank shell. Three more tanks were lost when the commander decided to lead his squadron through a minefield. The remaining 13 tanks entered St. Aubin to support the struggling North Shore infantrymen. While the assault brigades were clearing their respective beaches, the 9th Brigade deployed reinforcements on the Nan White sector. When the landing craft touched down, the beach was so overcrowded that the companies couldn't disembark from their landing craft. Infantry, tanks, and light vehicles were all trying to move towards the exits as the engineers were still clearing mines and beach obstacles. The 9th Brigade's ultimate objective was Karpike Airfield, outside Khan. The North Nova Scotia Regiment boarded the tanks of the 27th Armored Regiment and set off for that objective. By nightfall, the entire Canadian 3rd Division had settled into defensive positions. It is well known that the deadliest of the five invasion beaches on D-Day was Omaha, where the Americans suffered heavy casualties. But what is not so well known is that the next deadliest beach was Juneau. Casualties sustained on the beach alone totaled 1,204 Canadian and British soldiers, and they increased as the troops moved inland. The Canadians had achieved a lodgment with the landings at Juneau Beach, although the battle to secure it would take several more days and require the defeat of several strong armored counterattacks. The easternmost Allied landing beach of the Normandy invasion was codenamed Sword. It was the responsibility of British Major General Thomas Gordon Rennie's 3rd Infantry Division, part of the British 2nd Army, and augmented by several special units that brought the total number of men who landed at Sword by nightfall up to nearly 29,000. Rennie's mission was to establish a bridgehead between Wistrom and St. Aubin sur Mer. Once that was done, the 3rd would drive inland to be in position, along with the rest of the Allied forces landing at Gold and Juno beaches, to take the city of Caen 10 miles south of the coast. It was known through aerial reconnaissance that there were numerous fortified bunkers and other fighting positions along the coast. One position in particular was worrisome, a four-gun battery at Merville, on the very eastern edge of Sword Beach across the Orne River. The caliber of the guns was unknown, but the best guess was that they were 155 millimeters with a range of 10 and a half miles, powerful enough to do serious damage to seaborne troops coming ashore. 
The task of putting this battery out of commission through the use of both a parachute drop and a glider landing had fallen to Lt. Col. Terence Otway and his 9th Parachute Battalion. Aerial photos revealed that encircling the battery were a 20mm anti-aircraft gun, several bunkers, trenches, and a partially completed anti-tank ditch. The entire position was surrounded by barbed wire obstacles and a minefield. A few miles farther south, two vital bridges spanned the Orne River and the parallel Khan Canal. Both of them would need to be captured by a small glider force and held long enough for the amphibious troops to fight their way to them. Chosen for this task was Major John Howard and his D Company of the Oxfordshire and Buckinghamshire Infantry Regiment, who would rush in silently in gliders and land close to their target bridges. Comprising the amphibious force of Rennie's 3rd Division were the three infantry brigades, the 8th, 9th, and 185th, and the 1st and 4th Special Service Brigades. The 1st Special Service Brigade also included a free French force of 177 French Marine Commandos. At 3 a.m. on June 6, the invasion at Sword Beach was heralded by a shelling and bombardment of the coastal defenses by Allied naval and air forces. This was followed four hours later by a large armada of landing craft full of apprehensive soldiers heading toward shore. The parachute and glider troops of the 6th Airborne Division landed shortly after midnight onto the eastern flank of the invasion area to isolate the battlefield so that the seaborne invasion force would not be hit by a counterattack coming from the east. The bulk of the initial wave of seaborne forces landed at 7.25 a.m led by the amphibious duplex drive tanks that began churning their way toward the shore. The tanks were followed by the 8th Infantry Brigade and by the Royal Engineers with their various odd-looking specialized vehicles that have been nicknamed Hobart's Funnies. Resistance on the beach was initially fairly strong, with wrecked vehicles piling up and casualties mounting. However, with most of their armored vehicles successfully landed, the British were able to quickly secure the immediate area. By 9.30, the engineers had cleared seven of the eight exits from the beach, allowing the inland advance to begin. British and French commandos encountered tough resistance in the seaside town of Wiestrom on Sword's eastern extremity, but were able to clear it of enemy strongpoints. As the struggle for the beachhead continued, the battles for the Mareville Battery and Orne Bridges were nearly over. The 9th Parachute Battalion's assault on the Merville Battery had not gone well. In fact, it had verged on disaster. Only 150 of the 750 paratroopers reached the battery. The rest were scattered for miles around. When Otway realized that no more men were going to suddenly appear, he ordered his men to assault the position. In the end, the battery was captured, but at a heavy cost, with 50 dead and 25 wounded. The remaining 75 paratroopers headed for their secondary objective, the village La Plante. The battalion, being too weak, only managed to capture around half of the village and had to await the arrival of the 1st Special Service Brigade later in the day to complete its capture. By contrast, Major John Howard's glider assault had gone off with barely a hitch. Within 15 minutes, the swift attack had succeeded, and several feeble counterattacks had been halted until the glider troops were relieved by the 1st Special Service Brigade at about 1 p.m. On the western flank of Sword, commandos of the 4th Special Service Brigade moved out to secure lyon sur mer and then link up with the Canadian forces at Juneau Beach, but encountered strong resistance and were pinned down by heavy fire for several hours. Around the main landing area, the men of the 3rd Infantry Division secured ermenville sur mer and encountered increasing resistance as they slowly fought their way up the Perrier's Ridge. Congestion as more men, vehicles, and equipment arrived on the beach further complicated matters. It was gradually becoming apparent that the British would not be able to link up with the 3rd Canadian Infantry Division, necessary to protect the British right flank in an immediate assault on Khan. The British advance stopped when the 21st Panzer Division, based around Kant, launched the only major counterattack on D-Day. The division, with its formidable inventory of some 117 Panzer IV tanks, was intended for use as a rapid response force. On the morning of June 6th, however, its commander was in Paris and Rommel was in Germany. The division was unable to finalize orders and preparations for a counterattack until late in the day. Two attacks were launched, east and west of the Orne, 
The eastern attack carried out by the 125th Panzer Grenadier Regiment was intended to destroy the Orne Bridgehead, but was almost immediately stopped in its tracks by intense Allied air attacks and naval gunfire. To the west, a larger armored group initially fared somewhat better, taking advantage of the gap between the Sword and Juno beaches. Elements of the 192nd Panzer Grenadier Regiment were able to reach the coast at Leon sur Mer by 8 p.m. Finding the coastal defenses there intact, they set about reinforcing them. By coincidence, 250 gliders of the British 6th Air Landing Brigade, on their way to reinforce the Orne Bridgehead, flew over their positions. Believing that they were about to be cut off, the Germans decided to abandon their defense. The two counterattacks cost the 21st Panzer Division 50 tanks. By the end of D-Day, some 28,845 men had come ashore at Sword Beach. British casualties amounted to 630 men killed and wounded. On the German side, the losses were terribly high. The 716th Infantry Division was completely destroyed. The troops were either killed or captured. The exact number of dead and wounded is unknown. But what had started out as a well-planned and perfectly executed amphibious operation soon turned into an exasperating slog. The drive towards Khan quickly ground to a halt as the Germans put up a stubborn defense in the villages and fields north of the city. The British and Canadians failed to take Khan within 24 hours of the landings as they had hoped. The tanks of the 21st Panzer Division were soon joined by those of the 12th SS Panzer Division. Three days later, the Panzer Lair Division arrived and added its armored strength to the defense as well, effectively blunting the British advance toward Khan. In a further attempt to take Khan, Montgomery pressed the attack with the 7th Armored Division, but a detachment of Tiger tanks led by Michael Whitman halted them at villers bocage on June 13th. It would not be until July 20th that the city, or what was left of it, was declared secured. An estimated 3,000 local residents were killed in the crossfire.